Today, after eight weeks of preparation, we're finally ready to dig into the amazing book of Revelation to hear what the Spirit has been saying to the churches for nearly 2,000 years. But first, we had to establish the correct perspectives in six different categories and discuss, for example, why we should hold to the literal reading of Scripture and what we mean by the literal reading. We had to establish why we should hold to the perspective of reactionism and what we mean by that term, especially in contrast to all of the other responses people typically stumble into. Also, we had to establish why the apocalyptic view of history is the correct and biblical perspective when compared to all of the other views. Plus, we had to establish why the futurist point of view is correct and why we hold to it. Then we had to establish why the premillennial position is the biblical position while we defined the differences between all three views. And finally, we had to establish why the post-tribulational view of the rapture is correct and why other very new theories should be rejected. Therefore, since we had to systematically discard all of those other faulty perspectives regarding apocalyptic prophecy, such as the book of Revelation, you can see why some folks get so confused by the last book of the Bible. But to understand all that we have learned so far, we had to develop some tools of communication by defining certain key prophetic words. And we also had to develop some very important tools of interpretation so that we would all clearly understand how to properly analyze scripture and more specifically Bible prophecy in order to get back to the original meaning of the Holy Spirit. But with these foundational perspectives and tools in hand, we can begin our journey through the last book of the Word of God free from centuries of misguided, allegorical, overly symbolic, fatalistic, escapist, or otherwise incorrect interpretations. And to set the stage properly, we should begin by employing the tool of historical analysis, because this will help us discover when the book was written, who wrote it, who it was written to, and what the purpose of the letter is. In terms of when the book was written, all of the best external and internal evidences indicate that it was written during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian around 96 AD. For example, Irenaeus, who was the disciple of Polycarp, who in turn was a direct disciple of the Apostle John, wrote in his book Against Heresies that the apocalyptic vision was seen not very long ago, almost in our own generation at the close of the reign of Domitian. Clement of Alexandria explained that John returned from the Isle of Patmos after the tyrant was dead, and early church historian Eusebius identified the tyrant Clement was referring to as Domitian. Around 236 AD, Hippolytus is said to have written, John, again in Asia, was banished by Domitian the king to the Isle of Patmos, in which also he wrote his gospel and saw the apocalyptic vision. And in Trajan's time, he fell asleep at Ephesus, where his remains were sought for but could not be found. Around 260 AD, the author of the earliest surviving Latin commentary on the book of Revelation named Victorinus, wrote about Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. He says this because when John said these things, he was in the island of Patmos, condemned to the labor of the mines by Caesar Domitian. There, therefore, he saw the apocalypse 
And when grown old, he thought that he should at length receive his quittance by suffering. Domitian being killed, all of his judgments were discharged. And John being dismissed from the mines, thus subsequently delivered the same apocalypse which he had received from God. Church theologian and historian Jerome later wrote, In the fourteenth year, then, after Nero, Domitian, having raised a second persecution, he was banished to the island of Patmos and wrote the Apocalypse, on which Justin Martyr and Irenaeus afterward wrote commentaries. But Domitian, having been put to death and his acts on account of his excessive cruelty, having been annulled by the Senate, he returned to Ephesus under Pertinax and continued there until the tithe of the Emperor Trajan, founded and built churches throughout all Asia, and, worn out by old age, died in the 68th year after our Lord's Passion, meaning 98 AD, and was buried near the same city. And Sulpicius Severus wrote, then, after an interval, Domitian, the son of Vespasian, persecuted the Christians. At this date, he banished John the Apostle and Evangelist to the island of Patmos. Plus, there is clear internal evidence of a late date for Revelation, when we consider that Paul was writing to Ephesus in 60-62 to 62 AD, and telling them, Having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers. Yet Jesus told this same church, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds which you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. This drastic change doesn't make sense if Revelation was written in 68 or 69 AD as some falsely claim, but it does make sense if over 30 years went by between the writing of Paul's letter thanking God for their genuine faith and love compared to the rebuke of Jesus that told them to repent and do the deeds they did at first. Also, Jesus tells the church in Laodicea, You say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Yet, during the cruel reign of Emperor Nero in 61 AD, the town of Laodicea was completely destroyed by an earthquake. So how could they be feeling so wealthy and apathetic, and completely without need, if their town was still rebuilding after such a great devastation. Even modern cities take decades to recover from such an earthquake. Obviously, the late date of Revelation is the only logical answer, and they were living in a fully rebuilt and thriving city when Jesus gave John that message. And we can confidently say, that it was John the Apostle who wrote down the book of Revelation, because Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Hippolytus, Sulpicius Severus, Victorinus, Jerome, Tertullian, and the author of the Muratorian Fragment all confirm that it was the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. Plus, all of those witnesses are confirmed internally because the author identifies himself simply as John four separate times. But if the author was not John the Apostle, as some have tried to claim, why would the writer not have included more than just the first name? The truth is that by just using the first name John, the writer indicates that he expected that he would be recognized universally and easily just as if he were the last remaining apostle. And while there are clear differences between the style of writing in the book of Revelation and John's epistles and gospel, the fact is that John was essentially 
taking copious notes while seeing one amazing vision after another. In fact, the visions were so amazing that he occasionally had to be reminded not to forget to write down what he was seeing. Plus, John was not necessarily in exile on Patmos when his epistles and his gospel were written, so he could have easily enlisted scribal help in those endeavors. But he was definitely on his own when he wrote Revelation, and all of these circumstantial differences easily explain why some variances in style exist. Additionally, we should note that John uniquely refers to Jesus as the Logos in his Gospel and his first epistle, and he also gives us the only other usage of that same distinctive title in Revelation chapter 19. Plus, references to Jesus with the title The Lamb are exclusive to John's Gospel and the book of Revelation, just as the phrase His Commandments only exists in the post-Messianic scriptures in John's writings. So now that we have conclusively established who wrote Revelation and when they wrote it, we can look inside the letter to see who it was written to originally and what the purpose of the letter was and is today. In chapter 1, at verse 4, we see very plainly that John wrote, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So there's no mystery to solve here. In fact, the churches in Asia are listed when Jesus dictates to John, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Therefore, no one can miss who the original audience of the Apocalypse was. Seven literal, real-life, first-century churches along a major road in Asia were listed in the order they appear on the road, and Jesus told John to send them all a book containing everything he was shown. But now we must answer one of the most important questions there ever is to answer about any epistle in the post-Messianic scriptures, and that is, what was the purpose of the letter? Now, we established many weeks ago that the purpose of apocalyptic prophecy is to warn God's servants about the things which will soon take place. And we'll see that confirmed all through this book but we can also dive deeper to see what other purposes John's prophetic letter fulfills. And to begin to do that, all we need to do is try to imagine what the Bible would be like if it ended with the book of Jude. Well, if the book of Revelation, and especially the last three chapters of it, did not exist, the post-Messianic scriptures would have ended with letter after letter describing a persecuted, struggling church. Jude speaks about certain men who crept into the church unnoticed, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Third John discusses a man named Diotrephes who would not even receive the beloved apostle John. So John explained, Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Second John warns about the sad truth that many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. And John explains, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. First John explains, little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Peter's second letter, 
warned about untaught and unstable people who were twisting Paul's letters and the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. First Peter spoke of the church facing fiery trials for the sake of Christ. James spoke about the rich persecuting the church, saying, Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? Hebrews explains that some in the church had become dull of hearing, and they were forgetting the first principles of the oracles of God. The epistle of Philemon reveals that Paul and Epaphras were prisoners for their faith. In Titus, Paul revealed, There are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped. In 2 Timothy, Paul declares that all those in Asia have turned away from me in the midst of his suffering and imprisonment. 1 Timothy mentions that some had turned aside to idle talk in their desires to be teachers of the law, and it also warns that Gnosticism had caused others to stray from the faith too. 2 Thessalonians reveals that the church was enduring persecutions and tribulations for the faith. 1 Thessalonians exposes the fact that certain Jews were persecuting Paul and his companions and forbidding them to preach the gospel of the Messiah to the Gentiles that they might be saved. And letter after letter reveals the church's struggles with heresy, persecution, apathy, dissension, and more. But the book of Revelation reveals how the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The book of Revelation declares how God will overthrow the demonic Babylonian world system and establish the throne of the Messiah on earth. The book of Revelation announces that our adversary Satan will be utterly and completely thrown down along with all those who follow him in rebellion against God. And the book of Revelation explains how the church will overcome and inherit the new heavens and the new earth to live happily ever after with their God. Brothers and sisters, while the book of Revelation most definitely fulfills its mission to warn God's servants about the things which will soon take place, this amazing book also declares how the story ends and the bride finally unites with her divine husband. So the big picture is, the book of Revelation is the capstone of the entire word of God. It wraps up the story of the redemption of the earth from the fall, and it boldly announces God is going to win in the end, and the devil, along with all who follow him, is already judged. More than any other book, the apocalypse makes it clear that there is no hope for those who continue to surrender to Satan's seditious seductions, but there is abounding eternal unspeakable joy in store for all those who love God and keep his commandments. Plus the same almighty God who created all things in the beginning will restore all things in the end. So there is only one Alpha and Omega who will triumph over every evil and inherit all things. Therefore, only within this awesome and inspiring overall context can we understand the full message Jesus was sending to the churches in Asia and every other church after them. You see, Jesus made promises to each of the churches in Asia and the promises were always to him who overcomes. But before we can really and completely trust those promises, we have to see that Jesus will overcome too. And the book of Revelation proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus will overcome. So that means we should listen to the judge of the whole universe when he makes a promise. Plus, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, Jesus is giving his church at large a detailed preview of the coming judgment. So we'll understand how he will judge us all in the future and how we can overcome and stand before the Son of Man. 
And that's why the letter begins with Jesus providing a sample prejudgment on each of those seven churches. And that's why each of those preliminary judgments includes the words, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If we picture getting a preview of how a teacher will be grading a test that we're currently taking, we can put these two critical introductory chapters of Revelation in their proper context. And now that we understand why those seemingly unrelated chapters are included in the last canonical book of the Bible, there's one other secondary purpose for the book of Revelation I should mention. As I pointed out, one primary reason John was given this vision was to warn God's servants about the things which will soon take place. But we have to ask, what about all of God's servants who have died over the last 2,000 years without seeing these prophecies fulfilled? What purpose could unfulfilled prophetic warnings serve? And to answer those questions, let me ask you another question. If you prepared for a hurricane and only faced a light drizzle, would a little light rain bother you? How about if you prepared for a rattlesnake, but you ended up facing an earthworm? Would you be relieved or frightened? The truth is that if the church obediently prepares to face the prophecies of the book of Revelation, then the church will be prepared to face anything. And if you make up your mind to remain faithful to Jesus Christ during the Great Tribulation, you will most likely remain faithful to Jesus Christ and just about any other trial you could ever possibly face. So not only does the book of Revelation provide us with hope in our eternal destiny with God and confidence in the fact that Jesus will overcome all things, the book of Revelation also prepares every saint to face the worst possible era of human history, so then they'll be prepared to face anything. And with this basic understanding of why we were given this amazing book, a book that tells us how this present evil age ends, let's begin by reading the introduction in chapter 1. John writes, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The very first word of this three-sentence introduction is the noun apocalypsis, where we get our word apocalypse from. And this word means the unveiling or revelation. But while this letter and the term apocalypse in general points towards the unveiling of Jesus Christ in the sky, here it's also used to describe a disclosure of truth that the Father gave to the Son to show his servants things that must shortly take place. And the second sentence indicates that we can picture this letter as a top secret disclosure of truth that God handed to Jesus, and when Jesus received it, he sent it through a messenger or angel to his servant John. But in the second sentence, John also makes it clear that he is simply a witness to the contents of the book of Revelation and the life of Jesus Christ. And he merely wrote down all that he saw. And the third sentence of this amazing document declares something that no other book in Scripture declares. Because no other book of the Bible ever pronounces a blessing over those who read it and those who hear it read. However, in order to partake in the blessing of Revelation 1-3, we have to do more than just hear or read the words of this prophecy. We also have to keep the things that are written in it, because the time is near. So what does John mean when he writes of a blessing for keeping the things written in Revelation? And where did he get that idea? 
Well, Jesus uses the same phrase John repeats in his introduction when he thundered. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And we can be sure that John heard Jesus pronounce that blessing before John wrote the introduction that included it in verse 3. So Jesus is the author of the very special blessing in Revelation. But what does it mean to keep the words we're about to study and digest? Does the word keep simply mean that we read and remember the words of Revelation? Well, in chapter 14, this same letter declares, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And the same Greek word for keep is used here in this passage, just as it was in the other passages we have seen. So when we keep the commandments, it means that we remember them, we believe them, and we obey them. And in the same way, we must remember the words of the prophecy of this book. We must believe the words of the prophecy of this book, and we must obey the words of the prophecy of this book if we desire to inherit the blessing. So now that we have a basic understanding of the first three verses that serve as an introduction to the book of Revelation, in verses 4 through 6, John addresses the letter and sends greetings to the seven churches in Asia Minor by writing, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. After John announces himself as writer, and the seven churches as his audience, he then used the customary apostolic greeting that begins with grace to you and peace. And you can find this same greeting in Paul's letters to Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, and Philemon, just as you'll find it in both of Peter's epistles. But John customized his salutation to the contents of the book of Revelation by sending greetings of grace and peace from the eternally existing God, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne as described in Revelation chapter 4. And he added that the greetings of grace and peace were sent to them from Jesus Christ. And he then used three special and completely unique titles for Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. In regards to the title of faithful witness, Proverbs declares, a faithful witness does not lie. And Peter quotes the Septuagint version of Isaiah 53, 9, when he wrote about the Messiah, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So the testimony of Jesus Christ is utterly and completely reliable, and no matter what the consequences were, he never uttered a lie. Therefore, he is the ultimate faithful witness, and all his words can be trusted entirely. And because Jesus was the first to rise from the dead, never to die again, he received the title firstborn from the dead. And this title is used in Paul's letter to the Colossians around 30 years earlier. But the reason this title matters so much is because Jesus proved that he holds the keys to death in Hades now and all who trust and follow him will rise to victory just as he did. And John also calls Jesus the ruler over the kings of the earth. And this refers to his title as king of kings and lord of lords. So later in the letter, when the lamb is called king of kings and lord of lords in chapter 17, and the word of God is called by that same title in chapter 19, there can be no doubt that Jesus is the object of adoration in those passages. And because John, 
is preparing the recipients of his letter to worship Jesus in spirit and in truth, he breaks forth in praise himself, saying, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How unspeakably marvelous it is to be loved by Jesus, our Messiah. How magnificent it is to declare his praises. Our creator willingly became our redeemer. Our judge became the perfect sacrifice. And by his own blood, he washed us and purified us so that we could partake in his glorious everlasting kingdom. Imagine. We, who were at one time wicked, rebellious sinners, now we can partake in the saints' inheritance in the light as kings and priests who serve Jesus and God his Father. Truly, when we understand all that Jesus has done for us, we will exclaim from the deepest part of our being, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.